Yeah, hello everyone. Thank you uh, for attending this event in person and joining us today. Uh, my name is Min Kyung Lee. I'm from School of Information. And I'm here today with the two fantastic PhD students, Angela Haddad from the Department of Civil Architectural and Environment Engineering and Angie Zhang from the School of Information. We'll jointly present uh, the work that we've been doing as part of the team on AI and future of racial equity. So in our work, we strive to make both academic and real world impacts. So for, from the academic point of view, we aim to produce research that advances understanding of the complex ways that racial equity impacts the design and deployment of AI. We also aspire to make real world impacts, uh, producing the concrete tools that our real world stakeholders can use, such as computational model, AI design toolkits, or policy recommendations, etc. And we all know that this cannot be done by one person's effort, so we also uh, try to form a strategic partnership with other researchers and then stakeholders. So our team has the <laughs> uh, collaborators from five departments across the city of uh, across UT Austin involving a computer science, information science, uh, civil engineering, public policy, and the communications. But we also have a forum strategic partnership with Austin, New York City, and also an MIT initiative on combating racial inequities. In leveraging our team's expertise, we deploy a mixed method using both qualitative and quantitative method. Uh, we use statistical models to analyze the large data set to understand whether there is any racial inequities. But we also complement this work by doing in-depth interviews so that we understand real-world barriers in implementing these models. And this is, shows just a list of outcomes that we, our research uh, seeks to achieve at the end. In addition to scholarly publication, we also want to highlight that we want to make uh, AI equity design toolkits or models for community engagement as well. So without further ado, like to give you concrete examples of kind of work that we do, we'll focus on two example projects and Angela and Angie will uh, present them in turn. So now I hand it to Angela. Um, thank you. So today I'm going to talk to you about issues of inequity when it comes to pedestrian safety. And uh, here I'm showing a graph that was posted by the CDC in 2020. And this graph shows the pedestrian fatality rates um, in years 2009 and 2018 by different race or ethnic uh, groups. And three rather shocking and unpleasant observations can be made from this graph. The first observation is that the, the death rate is increasing with time. So we can always see that the dark blue bars are always higher than the light blue ones. And this means that our streets are just becoming more and more dangerous to pedestrians with time. However, the streets appear to be more dangerous for some pedestrians more than others. And this brings me to my second observation, which is that racial minorities are overrepresented in the pool of pedestrian fatalities. For example, here we can see that black and Hispanic pedestrians are at a higher risk or have a higher death rate compared to the national average or the total or the white pedestrians. And in addition to that, a third observation is that the scale of disparity has significantly increased with time. The overrepresentation of minorities in the pool of pedestrian fatalities is the gap is just increasing with time and this means that something is happening and we can spend all day talking about statistics but at the end of the day there's a problem that needs to be solved and there is specifically a need to unpack the mechanisms that link racial and ethnicity components with the elevated pedestrian crash risks. And that is necessary in order to plan for and ensure safe mobility for racial and ethnic minorities. So to address that issue in our research, we will focus on this specific framework. In pedestrian safety research, 
There are three main factors that are considered to contribute to pedestrian crashes. And these are exposure, resistance, and built and pedestrian environment. Exposure factors correspond to the variables that increase contact with vehicular traffic or increase the opportunities for pedestrian crashes. Resistance refers to the, it's borrowed from social theory and it refers to the fact that racial minorities are less likely to comply with the laws due to the lack of trust in the systems. And finally, the built environment, which is a group of variables that describes the state of the transportation network that is existing in a certain area. And we will use this combination of variables to try to predict whether they affect whether the, a certain area is majority black or not black, for example. And the area we're focusing on is a block group, which is just a group, a group of blocks, which is the bottom square on the slide. And then in this case, if we were able to show that black block groups are in fact have different characteristics compared to non-black block groups, and these differences make black block groups more dangerous, and this will definitely justify the over-representation of black pedestrians and uh, pedestrian crashes. Um, however, and that usually refers to the systemic and structural racism that is talked about, especially in the transportation field. However, we take this a step further, and we try to control for all the factors that might cause pedestrian, black pedestrians to be at a higher risk of fatalities or crashes. And we're trying to see if we, foc if we control for all these variables and factors, is the predicted number of black pedestrian deaths and serious injuries higher than expected? And if that's the case, that would indicate another implicit racial bias that is not accounted for by the structural racial bias that is often talked about. And to do that, we're 75%, almost 75% from within our framework. And uh, I'm not sure if I'm good on time. I hope I am. But I will focus on the data uh, for this part. So we'll, we're trying to implement this framework in the city of Houston using crash data between 2012 and 2021. So in Houston, almost 20% of the block groups are 20% having majority black populations. And within the, our pedestrian data and crash data, we classified based on injury type and racial breakdown. Uh, so first we noticed that almost 20% of our data is just fatal or serious injuries. And this is the only one that will be usable in our study because we're focusing on that specific level of severity of crashes. So we notice, for example, black pedestrian crashes constitute 27.5% of the total number of crashes in Houston. However, in the population decomposition in Houston, the black population is only 17%. So, it's, so if this thing was equitable, we should see 17% black crashes, but we see 27%, which indicate that it's much higher. And going back to our factors, so exposure variables can include car ownership, modes of transportation, traffic volume, population density. And here I'm showing that, for example, in majority not black block groups, 6% of the population owns zero vehicles, while 12% of the majority black block groups own zero vehicles. And this is a significant difference. Owning less vehicles make you more likely to be a pedestrian and increases your exposure to crashes. Next, we have resistance, and also the data shows that for example, there's a significantly higher crime rate in majority black block groups in Houston. And finally, the built environment, such as road and intersection densities, um, length of sidewalks, number of transit stops, we also see that majority black block groups have a significantly higher transit density or more bus stops. And transit is highly correlated with, with being a pedestrian, which is also makes you more exposed to crashes. And these only cover the structural racism. So we know that the areas where black pedestrians are likely to be are more dangerous. But we're, in this research, we're trying to answer whether is this just it or is there something else that is also going there? Is there an implicit bias or not? So we're trying to control for all these differences because we know they exist to see if there's something else as well that's playing a factor. 
And going forward, we'll try to optimize and fine tune our models to make sure we make reliable and robust conclusions to make you know, such an important claim uh, if there is, in fact, any implicit bias going on in, that, in pedestrian safety particularly. And now uh, my colleague Angie will talk more about her project. I'll be going through our project around designing tools for equitable AI in the public sector. Over the past few years, the interest in using AI in the public sector has increased. And uh, presently, AI that's used in local and state governments um, have crossed different domains, including child welfare services, as you can see on this slide, public safety, and then also public housing resource allocations. Um, but the increased use of these AI systems poses different risks, and especially in the public sector, which is affecting citizens and civic services, the stakes are even higher. So some of the um, potential risks and issues that this can pose is that a lot of the stakeholders who are impacted by these types of systems usually don't know that they're being affected by them or they're not included in the creation of them. Um, additionally, the developers of these systems are usually far removed from those lived experiences. And then finally, or not finally, but another issue is that oftentimes minority and low income populations are the ones who are disparately impacted, especially if the design of AI systems embeds systemic um, and racial biases. So there have been efforts over the past few years in creating frameworks and guidelines and toolkits to try to address this and how can we uh, make sure that we are thinking about equity in the creation of algorithmic systems, but we still lack these understandings as to the challenges in practice. So what we're trying to do here with our research is address this in identifying what are the opportunities and challenges in implementing equitable AI in public sectors in practice and to use this knowledge to craft an equity-driven AI design toolkit. So in our research, we worked with the city of Austin, specifically the equity office. This was established in 2016 in particular to address the history in Austin of systemic biases and racial inequities. Um, one of the efforts that they put together was an equity assessment tool where they worked with all of the departments in Austin in order to help understand um, what is the role of equity in their responsibilities and in their outcomes. And our project was really an extension of this equity assessment in looking specifically at equity with relation to AI and technologies that they use. So we worked with 15 uh, employees and we had focus groups and interviews um, with them from seven different departments. And the four topic areas that we covered, um, procurement, tech policies and operations, outcomes and community engagement, were based off of studying and adapting the previous areas and topics that the equity office had used when they were conducting their equity assessment with the departments. We also added community engagement as a new one because we really wanted to see how the departments were thinking about community engagement and their consideration of technology that they're procuring and how they're looking at the um, impacts of the technology they use. So um, we've been working on thematic analysis and I'll focus on these two themes in the middle right here. The first one that we focused on was processes to assess equity in and of technologies. And something that we heard very early on from the departments were that they lack some kind of formal process or method by which they can actually think about equity with the technology that they're using or the technology that they're thinking about buying. So you can see here this department that we spoke to, they, were, <laughs> they had these questions and when we asked them, what are the procedures that you guys have in place to try to test for biases and racial inequities? They were very frank and open in saying, we, that they don't know how the development of procured AI is done in an equitable way, and they don't have any data to test it. They don't have any measures or metrics that they currently use to know um, what these uh, outcomes might be and their impacts on the communities in Austin. So one of the considerations that this leads to when we're thinking about an AI equity toolkit is trying to support these departments and identifying what are the appropriate measures and metrics that they should be using in these different steps of technology, of procuring it, testing it, using it, evaluating it. Um, something else that comes into play though is when we were speaking with the different departments, they have different types of AI that they're using. They might be kind of nascent in their stages of it. Um, so you have some who are developing chatbots, and then you have some that are using immersive drones and robots. 
but different AI equity, different AI types are going to require different measures for measurements. So you're not gonna use the same metrics for if you're trying to develop some kind of algorithm for resource allocations as you would if you're concerned about public safety and using computer vision. So how to support these technologies, how to support these departments then and identifying the different types of AI and the appropriate corresponding measures that you should use for that. Um, something else that we heard that I think is very notable is in speaking with one of the departments that's pretty advanced in their use of AI, they were, in addition to the frustration of not really knowing how to evaluate it um, for its impacts on equity, they talked about how in procurement, you know, with their sellers, it's always like, hey, come buy this from us, but never what are, you know, what are y'all's goals or what are the ways that we can improve these kinds of technologies? Um, so... Maybe another implication that we see of this coming out of an AI equity toolkit is that it can help empower these state and local governments in identifying like what are the AIs that we should be procuring, what are these steps in place we should be thinking about for equity, but also kind of being able to compel public sec or private sectors and industries into thinking about equity as they're developing their products. Um, so hopefully being able to turn this less of a one-sided dynamic between public sector and industries and maybe something that's a little bit more um, two-way. Two <laughs> so the second uh, theme that I'll talk about is this opportunity that we heard from the departments to leverage interdepartmental collaboration. So something that we recognized when we were speaking with them is that all of these departments have these specialties and there's these expertises that have a role in enabling equity in their technology systems. And so one of the things that we heard from, again, this department that was already working with some pretty advanced emerging technologies was that there's this very steep learning challenge or learning curve with technologies that you're acquiring and that you're using. And they'd already gone through that. They already had the headaches of it. And so they viewed themselves as a resource for other departments to be able to assist them, whether it's through workshops or other knowledge transfer. Um, and then on this second quote, we have another department in the city of Austin that, especially with COVID-19, they had to really ramp up their community engagement practices. Um, and they, they viewed themselves as being able to establish these best practices for how to engage with communities. They spoke about the importance for them to reach out to community partners so that they could have better outreach to black and brown communities that they weren't able to hear from and they weren't able to distill important information to. And they also spoke about how they were trying to implement more inclusive and accessible practices to um, enable uh, stakeholder feedback in ways that are uh, beyond the traditional ways that they had normally pursued. Um, and so these kind of considerations led us to thinking about how a toolkit should really leverage the existing subject matter expertises and knowledge across the departments, especially because with any kind of tool, not just an AI equity tool toolkit, you want to ensure that you're helping to support the users in encouraging them to use and how they should be adopting the toolkit, not just telling them these are good things that you should be doing. Um, and this would also be helping to um, I guess, honor the different employees and how they had this desire to be sharing their knowledge across departments. Um, so really here, highlighting the internal AI knowledge and community engagement best practices. Um, and something else on here that I wanted to highlight was we've really been thinking about how community engagement can be um, a really important factor to ensuring equitable AI practices and something that we really want to think about including in this toolkit and especially being able to leverage this department that has such great, that has been de developing and trying to work towards best practices for community engagement um, is an opportunity for other departments to really fold in um, those, uh, try to incorporate more community engagement so that they can better center their equity goals and concerns. So our next steps are we're continuing to synthesize these themes and these findings for the development of an AI toolkit. Um, and we really see this as being something that goes beyond just the city of Austin, but something that's really applicable to other state and local governments who are struggling with similar issues of how can we build and use equitable and responsible technologies. And thank you. I think we have a few minutes for questions and you guys can feel free to reach out to us after the symposium. Uh, we use the word toolkit a lot. What is a toolkit? What's what are the components of that? I think
think that's a great question because that's something our team has been talking about a lot, especially when, I guess as like a separate project, we've been looking at how there are different cities and organizations that put together things that are toolkits and frameworks and guidelines, and they kind of refer to them all as the same thing. Um, I guess for our purposes, what we're really thinking about are what can be um, educational resources that they might be able to use but I think in developing our specific toolkit, what we want to do is be able to go back to the equity office and come back to them with what we have been hearing and kind of combine efforts with what they're already doing. So I think it would be things that would include what's been done in the past of providing educational resources, things that might be these guidelines or checklists to make sure that you, know, you have scaffolding steps as you're going through a procurement process. Um, identifying the different stages that they should be thinking about equity and how they might be able to integrate community engagement. Um, so kind of a vague answer, but you know, also uh, kind of the practice as everybody else has been defining toolkits and frameworks in the past. <laughs> Got to get the steps in. <laughs> Thanks. I really appreciate learning more about this great project. Um, you know, it seems there's a there. This is related to the toolkit question. There's a there's a related challenge from a research perspective, right? Of how to start. You talked about community engagement and really surfacing the the embedded knowledge of the the workers who've had to kind of adapt and articulate these systems to to get their their work done. From a research perspective, you want to make that visible, and you know, I'd be interested in hearing you know, methods that you have for that. But I think from the, the toolkit perspective, you want to generalize what goes in there so that the organization itself can realize that that kind of tacit knowledge is a big part of what they need to mobilize. And so then uh, applicability beyond Austin would be enabling each organization to kind of ad identify and, and really foreground that tacit knowledge and make it a resource. So uh, a, a question about how you know, <laughs> and then a, maybe a suggestion about what toolkits could consist of. Can you repeat the question? My brain jumped immediately to, I totally agree with that last point he's making. <laughs> <laughs> well, so yeah, so if we all agree that, that these toolkits need to give the community a, a tool for surfacing its tacit knowledge, how do you as researchers know what that is? And then how do you equip kind of a version of that that the organization could do itself? I think we definitely started just in like these initial interviews and focus groups. The employees are really open about the efforts that they have put in and like the challenges and struggles they've personally had with reaching communities or thinking about equity. So I think by something that we'd love to do is continue having um, like these workshops with specific groups, probably focus on like one department instead of all of them and having it be too broad. Um, so I think I would love to work with those who are already developing best practices for community engagement. Um, and then, yeah, going from there, working in partnership with them in the equity office and hopefully also being able to engage with community partners would be an ideal goal of mine. Yeah, I think we are out of time. Um, but thank you guys so much and feel free to reach out to us after the talks today. Thank you so much. <laughs>